Yep. Hey everybody, welcome to Goose's Wrestling Pod. Uh, we're still in 1989. We're at SummerSlam 89. We're in the summer of 89. And uh, of course, I'm wearing a Heart Foundation shirt. You like that, Andrew Lee? Damn. Jim Nyhart's got a big ass gut in that shirt. I know, right? Well, they, they made it after he died. So, dude, I wish we were back in 1989 for real. For real. Yeah. Um, before we get into the show, uh, and just so you know, I want to give you a heads up on this show. This was the first paper you I ever saw live. Like, I watched this live. You mean, mean you were there? No, I, my friend ordered it. And me and oh, his family. Okay. You actually watched the pay-per-view. Okay, I see what you're saying. Wow. How old were you? I was eight. How old was your friend? He was eight. We got his, we got his parents to order it. Wow, that's amazing. I know, so it was I, a good. I was too poor to ever afford a paper. Well, yeah, we didn't order a lot, but this one I got to see live. There's a few that I got to see live, and then um, around 2000, I watch every all of them live. But that that's a long time coming. When you were a kid and you watched this when you were eight years old, did you think it was amazing? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I thought your was... take, now that you see it, what do you think? Well, we'll talk about that in a second. We'll talk about that in a second. It's still, it's not the, it's not the worst, but um. Before we get into that, uh, well, this weekend starts um, AEW Collision on Saturday nights. Is that this Saturday? See, this Saturday, yeah. I did not know that. I'm I'm ready for that. But I really kind of feel like they fucked up the hype for this, and they've kind of ruined CM Punk and a lot of other things. Um, Tony Khan's press tour is not mentioning the scrum. He's not mentioning like the drama. He's not. He's just like kind of pretending it didn't happen. And this is the problem with that approach: is that your fan base is terminally online. Your fan base, your you cater, and you've made it very specific. You cater to people that never log off Twitter, right? You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And like, You're to the point, yeah, I know. I don't know what happened with that. Uh-huh. Oh, there it goes. To the point where, like, people, if people tweet, like, who's a Okada, and we had this talk a few weeks ago, or who's the Viking guy from Mexico, your fucking fans are screaming at you that you should just know this and you should be watching New Japan or AAA and you're an idiot because you don't know this guy that has never been on the show before. So you're catering to those people. You are. We forbid it. All this shit. You just had people show up from New Japan. We got to know who they fucking are. So these people saw the scrub. These fans saw the scrum, right? So mm-hmm. for now, for you now to pretend like that didn't happen or to not play into it, I think it's really insulting to the fans. And also, again, you're catering to people that listen to Dave Meltzer and Brian Alvarez all fucking day. That's who you market towards. For months now, Dave Meltzer and Brian Alvarez have been shitting on CM Punk and acting like he was holding the company hostage. Literally the entire time they've been anti-CM Punk. And other reporters that put out anti CM Punk shit, you've done nothing to counter it. Now you want to ignore it. I feel like the hype. There's really not a lot of hype for Saturday, and I also feel like people are gonna like just not watch this show or get into it because you're not addressing the elephant in the room when all you ever you're not addressing the internet chatter when all you do is address internet chatter. That's your whole fucking book booking philosophy, you know. Can I just say one thing about that? Supposedly yeah. though. They might not be able to talk about it for legal reasons, because if that's the case, that changes everything, right? Yeah, but then why are these people still working in the same company then? Um, maybe you can work in the same company, but you're just not allowed to talk about it because they may be in the process of maybe taking a and trial Tony or something. Khan, Tony Khan put himself in this in this position by not. Well, yes. Yeah. I agree with that. I agree with that. He put himself in the situation. And and he's not getting himself out of the position because he should have made a hard line with all these people. If we're moving forward, we're all working together. We're turning this into an angle. And whoever you feel less viable, he should have fired. Well, not, you know, like, did you see Eric Bischoff's? I know you don't like Eric Bischoff. You see Eric Bischoff's quote with Ariel Hawali Hawali that came out yesterday? Uh, What did the Hawali say? Well, he asks about AEW, and he goes, it's a well-financed hobby, but that's all it is a hobby. He goes, like, this. the CM Punk thing is a perfect example. CM Punk emasculated him on live TV, 
And the fact that he's coming back is absurd. He, he humiliated Tony Khan and, and emasculated him in front of all of us. I was saying that before uh, Eric Bischoff said that, that I said this is a rich man's toy, mm -hmm. right? So it's nothing new to me. Yeah, that's but, what it uh, is. And it's, it's, it's fine if you want to bring back CM Punk, but this needs, I mean, you need to, uh, let's see what happens Saturday. I have a feeling Saturday it is going to be addressed, whether there's a lawsuit or not, because Punk is Punk. But I think that this starting collision is going to be the thing that, that I think it's going to rapidly, it was turning into TNA already. It's going to rapidly like make AEW become TNA much faster. I don't think you, you know, can... I'll be honest with you. I, I'm okay with everything. Here's the thing yeah. I said it from day one. I don't think he gives a shit about making money and really mm -hmm. big, crazy rating because he's already really, really wealthy, right? He is, this is like his, this is his, this is a rich man's owning a comedy club kind of situation. This is his toy. This is his playpen. These are his action figures. And if that means that I get more wrestling with stars that WWE no longer wants, that I could still get to see them, including CM Punk, even if sometimes the storylines are garbage, I'm okay with that. Yeah, you you're know? okay. Yeah, but I'm okay with that. I think it's stupid, see, but yeah, you, you're okay with it. But I think the the average person that they've been catering towards, the fucking internet loser, I think right now you're kind of insulting them by not addressing the CM Punk situation. And I yeah, think right. What do you call it? Uh, like, okay, you keep saying, you know, if you, I have no doubt, I've agreed with you when we've talked on offline about this, about how if this turns into like it is, there's a good chance of turning into the Jeff Jarrett's already there. It's already TNA, right? But here's the thing: I watched TNA, right? And I watched <laughs> right? TNA Even when it was garbage, I was watching it. So I'm one of those people that I'm gonna shit on it, but I'm still gonna watch it I while mean, I'm yeah, sitting. Yeah, but you know, but, but I mean, I, this is just a support because there were fans that thought this was gonna be. They were gonna. I mean, dude, there were people even in 2021, and Brian Alvarez and Dave Meltzer were, were that were like they're gonna overtake WWE, like they're gonna do it, and that's not happening. And um, no, no, they were they, never, they were never gonna take over. You're sooner to see them in an in an Albany barn barn like impact. Like they're gonna be, they're, it's it's gonna be rapid. They're not moving tickets for Collision. I think Collision was a massively dumb idea. I think it was massively stupid, but they're, unless they're getting more money for it, nah, uh, no, I don't think they are. That yeah, million dollar deal wound up being a complete lie. They didn't, they didn't re up, they didn't re up their contract. It's still the same contract. But you're, but they're getting money for it. Yeah, yeah, but they're not getting extra money. What do you mean they're not getting extra money for an extra TV show? They didn't re up the deal. It just was added to this deal. They could still cancel them at the end. They didn't re up the dynamite deal, in other words. So whenever dynamite but, expires, but all but the I, I understand that, but they're saying like TNT is like, hey, make us a Saturday show and we'll give you money for the Saturday show, right? No, I understand that, but like I get what you're saying. So they but what I'm saying to you is whenever the I think the deal is up in 2024, 2020. Yeah, I think it's up in 2024. They could yeah. still just cancel them. They didn't re up the deal. Which I would have, if I'm Tony Khan, and again, I know what we said about him. All right, you want to add a second show, re-up my deal for Dynamite. Like, let's do it now. Because I'm, you're adding, you're giving me all this extra workload. It's great. You're, well, but let's if you were a businessman, yeah, you would do that, right? But he's just probably, kind of probably happy with what he gets. My fear is, my fear is what if Collision's a complete disaster? And Rampage becomes even more of a disaster. And then Dynamite starts suffering. And then TNT and TBS are like, eh, maybe we'll just have reruns of Friends. No, it's not going to die. Because he's going to do, even if TNT gets rid of them, he is going, he's rich. He's, he's gonna, I know, rich. he's going to start his own streaming thing. Yeah. He is going to put it all online like Ring of Honor. Right? Okay. No, no, listen. And, I know you're you're happy with that, and I'm fine with that. But I just yeah. feel bad for these fans who thought that they were going to get the next WCW. Yeah, here's the thing. Here's the thing. What this is what makes it really sad is because they hundred percent, and I still believe this, they have the potential to overtake WWE. 
right? Potential. The word there is potential. Yeah. It's never going to happen because as much as I shit on this person and I don't like this person, in order to get to that level, you need someone like a junior. You need a Vince McMahon junior person. He, as evil as he is, he is also like so driven and so he's such a visionary. He gets, he's the one who took WWF to where it is today. Tony Khan is nowhere near that. He's not even a Shane McMahon. And this, oh. yeah, like if you told me, if you told me Shane McMahon was in charge of AEW with the with what they have now, like with what they have now with CM Punk, Daniel Bryan, everything they have now, the only thing you you change is instead of Tony Khan as Shane McMahon, I would say yeah, there's a very good chance they could reach like equal level. I believe that. I really do. I don't think he's. I don't think Shane is as stupid as as Tony Khan. You no. know. Yeah. No, um, he, 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 this ain't his business. Dude, first of all, I just want to mention two more things about AEW before we uh, go on. Yeah. First of all, this fucking Briscoe brother now is a team with Audrey Edwards and his dad against Jeff oh, Jarrett. Jesus Christ. They had the chance to make this guy into one of their top baby faces. This is the second time they bungled. And I know it's like, oh, you want to exploit it. Yeah, you should exploit it, Dad. I'm sorry, but like, if, if like, Bret Hart was in the WWF in 1999 and when Owen died and he still stayed in the company. I would have immediately gave Bret the fucking title. You know what I mean? Like, you should use that to elevate. It sucks, but, like, they turned Mark Briscoe, is it Mark? Yeah, it's Mark, into a fucking joke when he could have been the hottest fucking face they had because everybody felt so bad for him. And now we see, and then here's the other thing. Here's the other thing. So remember what Jeff Jarrett, what did Jeff Jarrett get hired for? What was his original hiring? um live events yeah house shows he was supposed to do mm -hmm. guess what they don't have any more booked of there's no they're, more no, more, they're no longer doing house rules they're no longer doing house shows because of collision so the thing he got hired for he's not doing and now he's a full-time tv star on AEW. well i'm okay with that because i think he's been very entertaining what a fucking <laughs> This guy gets conned by everyone, man. It's fucked. That dude, I think Hulk Hogan could gain full control of this company if he had like an hour with this guy in a room. Yes. Yes. Maybe 45 minutes. Yeah. Because I just I I just it's just fucking wild to me that Jeff Jarrett was hired for a specific reason. That's re by the way, also a prediction. I think Jeff Jarrett's winning the Owen Hart Cup. You think Jeff Jarrett's what? Going to win the Owen Hart Cup this year. No. Yes. I'll tell you no. why. I'll tell you why. He uh, was with Owen in the ho in the hospital room when he died. Um, he talked to his podcast how that kind of led to him becoming an out. Like, he never really dealt with watching Owen die. And he went to the hospital. And Owen was like, either he, he either saw Owen dead or Owen was dying. But he did see the corpse. He saw Owen some part. Owen Hart died on the way to the hospital. That's how they knew at the yeah yeah yeah. So release. so Jeff saw the corpse. Yeah Jeff, yeah. Jeff saw the corpse. And he yeah, talked about his yeah. podcast. So and he said he never really dealt with that. He didn't go to therapy about it, and that led to him becoming more of an alcoholic and a drug abuser. And now he just reunited with the Owen Hart family. I think they're going to use what happened to him. I think he's going to tell Tony. Wouldn't it be a great story? If I won the Owen Hart tournament and then I finally put my demons to rest and then I hug Martha and I, I think he's going to win the Owen Hart. I'm telling you right now he's winning the Owen Hart tournament. I mean, God, I want to say no, but it's Tony Khan. It is, a, but let me tell you something. It is a good, it is a good story. Like this guy had to wrestle right after his friend died. He saw the guy's corpse. Be, that's why he became a fucking alcoholic. And now he turned his life around. And now he's going to win the tournament in Owen Hart's name. It's a good story. Yeah, that's a very tragic. You know, that's a very that's a tragic thing to go through. You know. Yeah, no, I feel bad for him. I feel bad. Yeah. Like and the fact, he never really dealt with it, and I get it because you you're literally like you're on the road the next day, and then you're in WCW, and then Vince Russo has you beating up Beetlejuice as or David Arquette, which we'll talk about down the road. So like, and then you start TNA, and there's midgets beating off in trash cans. So there's a lot of things that you were going through in life, and you couldn't process it. So I do feel bad for him on, uh, but but but. Well, all that being said, he he should never be on TV again. 
So, but he's gonna win the fucking tournament. Ah, we'll see. We'll see. You know, uh, yeah, we'll see. He, I mean, he, I don't know. I have no idea. Tony Khan. I wish. That's uh, he's uh, he he's my Dixie Carter in the sense that can I, like can I, no can Dixie I tell you? Carter is the reason why TNA was like still around, but she was the worst part about TNA and. Yeah. Tony Khan, the reason why we got these cool moments like CM Punk returning on Rampage, um, the first stadium stampede, and just all these other cool, like Cody's t- title reign and all this cool stuff. I, It is because of him, but at the same time, he's like the worst thing about this whole program. Can I tell you, I think everything went to shit. I think everything in there, and they never really recovered the booking, everything. You can see everything went to shit when Hangman Page cut that promo. The moment that CM Punk threw a monkey wrench at that guy, he didn't know how to react. And the company has been booked horribly since that. Since you that, know what? and that's also like, man, this has some sensitive shit from CM Punk. Man, he's so sensitive. But you know what? I feel like Vince would have squashed that right now. CM yeah, Punk, yeah, of course, of course. But that's um. That is, you have to admit, that is some soft skin shit. That is, but I, you know how many fires, potential fires, Vince or Triple H probably have extinguished that we don't know anything about. Oh, you know, that's what I. That, and that's what I meant. Like this company has so much potential to be number one. The only thing they're lacking is they don't have that Vince McMahon guy. You know, yeah. so right before. He, I'll tell you this: that no, no one knows this. Right before Sasha Banks walked out, her and Kevin Owens had an incident where she physically shoved Kevin Owens for no reason. And he got really pissed. He was like, don't you put your hands on me. Are you serious? Yeah. They had to pull them aside and it was squashed and you never, no, it's not out there. There's a comic who writes for WWE that told, told some people. Really? Um, Yeah. Did he, didn't really go out there anywhere. So that's what I'm saying. You're Googling it. Like it had to be out there. No. I'm saying there's a million little moments like CM Punk getting mad at Hangman Page that we don't know about, probably since the beginning of wrestling history, that the bookers and the producers squash before it, before we know about it. And um, and he doesn't know how to do that. He had a moment. He had a really bad moment. He didn't know how to handle it, and it's led to this. Dude, Tony Khan doesn't know how to make announcements. I know. What <laughs> makes you think? Even his announcements are weird, where he doesn't blink. He just stares like in his weird, like he doesn't even know how, he doesn't know how to, he doesn't know how to greet people. Like he hugs them in a weird way. He doesn't know how to give announcements. What makes you think he could do all that other stuff? Come on, you're asking too yeah. much. <laughs> you're asking for too much, my friend. So yeah, yeah. so anyway, by the time this is out, Collision, I'm I'm actually going to watch the first episode because I do think CM Punk's going to go rogue. That's my prediction. He's going to do something that's going to make Tony Khan regret bringing him back on night one. Oh, I would love that so much. I, I, so I'm going to watch it. And then I'm probably going to watch week two because I'm going to stay home. I'm not going to do Ryan's show. Again, if I get a road, this is different. If I get like a road gig, I'm going to take it. But I'll probably skip Ryan's show to watch Money in the Bank. And then I'll, since I'm already home, I'll watch Collision. So I'm going to watch the first tweaks. After that, I'm probably not going to watch it again. I'm probably going to be filling out job opportunities. Okay, we'll, we'll talk about that later. But speaking of jobs... Let's talk about SummerSlam 89, the second ever SummerSlam. Um, overall, I I liked it. Um, I didn't love it, but there were some great moments. What about you? Yeah, this felt like I was, I was, you know, a part of me because uh, the beginning when we started this, the NWA was so fucking terrible, while the WWF pay-per-views in the beginning were so good that every time I were, were reviewing a WWF, pay-per-view i'm so excited for it and it's like a treat but halfway into this it started really feeling like a job you know because i don't think i think this is one of those pay-per-views you don't need to watch i don't think it's that good well if you're also a warrior fan you should watch it um possibly yeah um i mean he's he's the guy who has the biggest um moment on the show it's kind of like his show this uh, might be like the best Ultimate Warrior match I've seen up to this point. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So Ultimate Warrior. So just I'll say that, and, and I, 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 me and my friend were going crazy even back in the day. Ultimate Warrior and Rick Rude steal the show. And yeah, I can see that. Yeah, they steal the show. I remember going nuts for this match. 
the Roddy Piper interference was perfect. It's you know, I'm sorry, go ahead. But we'll talk about that as we get closer. But and then I thought there were a couple of good matches, but all in all, like nothing of consequence happens except for Ultimate Warrior. Yeah, we'll get right into it. Summer Slam, feel the Latino heat. Uh, this is takes place. Did you notice, by the way, Kevin Dunn and Stephanie in the opening thing? No, yeah, Kevin's the little girl eating like. That was and, Stephanie, and then there was a guy playing golf. That's Kevin Dunn. Oh, it was I'm gonna have all to off his people. It was all off his people and their kids in the opening thing. Oh, okay. So SummerSlam Feel the Heat uh, takes place on August 28th, 1989, at the Meadowlands Arena, which no longer exists in East Rutherford, New Jersey. Twenty thousand people are in attendance. Tony Schiavone actually introduces us, um, intros us. To the show with Jesse Ventura, so there's no Gorilla Monsoon at the show, which is weird. But well, I think um, he, at the time he was, I think this was like he's gonna he Tony Tony Schiavone was kind of he was the first Michael Cole, like he was supposed to eventually take over for everything. Yeah, because you know Gorilla is already old. Tony Schiavone's yeah. not very young here. I mean, Tony, you know? I mean, if it worked out, he could still be on Raw right now. Yeah, Imagine that. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Tony Schiavone kind of is aging very well. You know, Tony Schiavone's better now than he was in the nineties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tony Schiavone's um, probably like the best part of AEW announcing to me. Yeah, we're already right off the bat, but this dynamic Jesse Ventura just really doesn't like Tony Schiavone. He's just like right off the bat, he's just like mad at this guy. And well, then they, because he's like, oh, I, I like it when I'm with Gorilla or Vince, and I'm with this. Dude, guy. I like Gorilla and Jesse the best. They're just like yeah, so yeah. great together. Myself. I, I, when I remember as a kid, I felt like Tony Schiavone didn't really mesh well with with the WWE. I thought it was yeah. like working. Yeah, it was kind of uh, he. I thought he was all right. He's better than like superstar Billy Graham. Yeah, they, okay. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, they I mean, should... talking, like, Josh Matthews is better than superstar Billy Graham. But... Yeah. So, uh, they introduce us to the show, and then they get that uh, video package which you were talking about, and it is basically with that classic SummerSlam music, and they got yeah. clips of wrestling. Uh, mixed in with random white people doing summer stuff, which is like the black women. What? Well, some black children. They had two black kids at the end. Everyone else was white. It's freaking ridiculous. Um, um, I'm gonna have to rewatch that because you're saying Stephanie's in there. I gotta see that. Um, we're gonna go right to our first match. It is the Heart Foundation versus the Brainbusters with Bobby Heenan. The Brainbusters are actually tag champions. But the title is not going to be on the line. This is similar uh, to the whole MJF versus Adam Cole thing. That's going to happen, right? This well, is stupid. Well, they, well, this is the problem. Remember this as a kid. They booked the match. And then I think it, the, it, was, it was supposed to be a non-title match because they didn't have the belts of Brain Busters. Mm-hmm. They got the belts in Sunday's Night's Main Event. And I remember as a kid, because I saw it. I went to a wedding, actually. And I saw it at the wedding and I was shocked that the Brain Busters won the title. So this wasn't meant to be a title match when he booked it. So he basically was like, nah, I guess I'll just, I guess Vince was like, I'll just make it non-title. Because I think he gave the Brain Busters title just to have something happen on Sunday's main event. That's actually kind of how Jesse Ventura explains it on commentary. That yeah. titles are not on the line because it originally it wasn't signed. And yeah. when Tony Schiavone questions it, Jesse goes, well, would you put the title on the line if you didn't have to? And, and Tony Schiavone thinks for a second and goes, yes, I would. And he's like, yeah, whatever, bro. <laughs> Anyways, but I like that. That was a very good dynamic. This thing about Jesse Fratora I really enjoy as a commentator is that he really made things – he really legitimized things. He, made, he A lot of stupid decisions by Junior, he he, he – makes he gives it sense he makes it make yeah sense. yeah he legitimizes things even though he's a heel he, a lot of things he does he makes sense and including this this match is very long but it's also very good uh when the finish happens when anvil has bret hart in a, like an inverted power slam position and he basically from the second term he basically inverted power slams him on to tully and they've got the cover, but Bobby Heenan distracts the referee, and Arn Anderson jumps off from the top with a double axe handle right on Brett's head. That he turns over for the cover and the win. 
the Brain Busters win, so they could have still put the title on the line. They didn't want to have that. Uh, what did you think about this match, man? I thought it was good. I remember liking it as a kid. I liked it again. I wish we had seen more matches with these two tag teams. Like this is the only time they face. I don't. They never fight fight each other again. So they never, they never fight each other again. No, and uh, it was good. Again, the Heart Foundation, one of the best tag teams. The Brain Busters, one of the best tag teams. And eighty nine was a very eighty nine was a very good year for tag teams. Yes. If you among both companies, you got the fucking Steiners, you got the uh, Legion of Doom, you got Doom is coming up, Ron Simmons and Butch Reed. Then over here you got the Brain Busters, the Rockers, the Rougeos, the Heart Foundation, Demolition, the Twin Towers. I mean Well, you know, it's not as good as AEW tag team scene from two years ago. Okay, everybody knows that's the best tag team scene of all time. <laughs> you know, Spanish announced project. By the way, oh, I hate to go back to AEW, but I last Friday <laughs> stayed home to watch SmackDown. I didn't have any shows, and then I put on Rampage. I shut Rampage off halfway through. That's why did they put Angelico with Luther and Serpentico? Oh, dude, I like that because I finally got to see them, and this is the reason why the Spanish announcing team. Projects were really, really bad. So, and Helico, who's actually uh, did a lot of training, extensive training in Mexico, him and uh, Serpentico, who was really John Cruz, they were doing the Spanish uh, uh, commentary. So, they're actually on the Spanish commentary team, and Serpentico and Luther. This is all on dark, right? This is all happening on dark, but not only dark, but the Spanish show, the Spanish version. Right? They never, they never explain that a dynamite or rampage. These three idiots just walk out and they do nothing to explain that. I think they you've done more to huh? not on rampage. They've done nothing. No, to they explain. explained it before, long time ago, and then like they they were on rampage. They explained it, and then they were not on rampage for about four or five months, and then now they're back. So yeah, they just walked out, and I'm like, why is this guy with these two? Anyway, during that match, uh, the acclaimed, like, it was going way too long, and I'm like, I just shut it off. I was like, he doesn't know what he's doing. Dude, you have to, like, reiterate that. You you have to just have, like, fucking yes, Excalibur. I agree. It's fucking stupid, man. Yeah. No, I agree, though. They should re-mention that, why this team is together, why they're called the Spanish Announce Project. That should be, that should be explained, right? I, I 100% agree. Um, what do you call it? Uh, it's one I thing think... they're on TV every week. You don't just, you don't explain to me why the acclaimed is with Billy Gunn because it's every week. It's every week, yes. But, but, but like something they... like the Spanish Announce Project, you see him on TV and then you don't see him on TV again for half a year. That's a long yeah. time. I agree. If the acclaimed hadn't been on TV since January and then they just walk out with Billy Gunn, you'd have to tell me again why Billy Gunn is with these fucking guys. Exactly. Like, yes. it's, just, it's just like, dude, anyway. Anyway, um, but, I will say the acclaimed had a very, very funny rap that that match. They did, they the, did. But uh, I shut that I shut that off halfway. I, I that was the match I just shut up and I put on fucking dude. I put on the Supergirl show. I was like, I'm just I'm I i can not with this fucking rap. <laughs> By the way, this uh, Heart Foundation versus the Brain Busters is the longest match on this pay per view. Yeah, um, it didn't feel that long. No, because it's this very. It's. I mean, Bret Hart's really good. I fucking love Bret Hart. He's so Bret Hart, good at selling. Bret Hart's already. Bret Hart's already proven himself. Yeah, and the Brain Busters are very good at tag team wrestling, like heel tag team wrestling. I think you know. I'm not covering anything. Dude, when new. Tully, when Tully left, or when Tully didn't go with Arn to WCW, I always saw Arn as Lester without him. Like, yeah, these two guys just really work well together. I, I, I know just, why. I know why. Like, uh, like. Tully got fucked by his enemies, and it's not Arn's fault. So Arn had to. It's not like Arn could have just got him back. Yeah, but I feel like Arn would have been such a bigger star if him and Tully had stayed together in WC. If him and Tully had been in WCW, um, first of all, I don't think he would have got injured the way he got injured. I think like, dude, if they let's say Tully and Arn are still a tag team by the the buyout, you probably could have put him on WWE TV in two thousand one, two thousand two, and it still would have worked. Possibly, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is a. There was a very good tag team, and it's yeah. The more I see of Arn and Tully, the more I'm like, this is like Enzo and Big Cass. These guys never should have been broken up. Yeah, I, I think um, I never appreciated Arn as much as I did unless they were in a tag team. And yeah. Tully, you know, I kind of goes without saying. Anyways, 
Uh, same, same, you can say the same thing about Jim Nyhart too, actually. Yeah. Uh, so well, me and Jim Nyhart kept going back to Brett. He kept being in Brett's orbit. Yeah, so. but I remember, I remember Jim Nyhart had a singles run in WCW and it fucking stuck. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He had that fake, like, goatee that he would give out to kids. Uh, like like red sunglasses. Do you remember that? <laughs> so stupid. Um, mean Gene. Oh, I did think. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't mean to interrupt you. I thought Nightheart was good in the new foundation. We're gonna see them soon. I thought the new foundation was good. Um, I guess. Yeah. All right. I mean, let's it's, move it's... Along. Okay, let's keep going. Let's move along. Gene. Uh, mean Gene. He is with Dusty Rhodes in his polka dot gear. The, by the way, if you're watching this on Peacock, because you texted me this, the quality is so fucking bad. That during this, you see those squiggly lines. You know those squiggly lines, mm-hmm. like when the VCR, the the when yeah. the video is not working. Do there's squiggly lines on the Peacock version? There's squiggly lines in the in the Peacock thing. Yeah, like you know, like when the VHS is not working and there's all the fucking like lines. So this is literally on Peacock. It, it's terrible. So a few years ago, uh, more than a few years ago, fifteen years ago, they put out a Royal Rumble box set. Eighty. I don't know why I didn't start watching these. Eighty-eight to two thousand seven. And the same thing, like, anyway, all the Royal Rumbles up until 2007 and all the Summer Slums up until 2007. And I bought them. And I remember, like, the quality of WrestleMania being horrible on Peacock. And then I put on SummerSlam. And I'm like, why am I not putting on SummerSlam? The box set is right there. You know what I mean? Why am yeah, I going to yeah, watch yeah. this? Picture quality. I don't, why don't they just take the fucking DVDs and upload them to Peacock? I don't know, dude. That's a very good question. I have no idea. Because... It's weird. Actually, there's even some parts of it because of the squiggly line, you kind of can't hear it that well, but it's very, I will give them that the rest of this pay-per-view on Peacock, there's no more squiggly lines, but it was but very even weird. Even if that squiggly squiggly one squiggly line means they, they just took a VHS tape and put it on Peacock. Yeah, it's fucking it's weird. Master, you know? I have the, my, I'm, I'm assuming my DVD is taken from the Masters, the original broadcast. Like, I don't understand, like, I think also the other the other reason why things on Peacock are lesser quality is because they went you know they edited out stuff they took out the DX promo they took out there's probably some other stuff that no one's noticed because people don't watch all these shows but I think like they put up lesser versions to get it up faster so they could edit out like anything they find offensive. Let me ask you a question: Do you think when WB had their own network? They were squiggly line for the SummerSlam no. when I was there. Oh, you think once it went to Peacock, they put the squiggly line in there? Yeah. Oh, okay. That's fair. That's probably true. Um, all right. Yeah, so... I used to think I, I think that they upload a different version of these events to Peacock than what's what's on the network proper. Because the okay. network is still going in other countries. So Yeah, yeah. I see if anybody's listening to this, if you're from another country, please check it out on your I don't know, if you're in Australia. If you happen to be listening to this, please can you just check if SummerSlam 1988, uh, 1989, yeah, has those squiggly lines. Um, where during the Dusty Roads, it actually starts right before the Dusty Roads promo. And and it here, let, let me give you, I don't know if you can see it. Do you can see a little bit of it? Do you see a little bit of squiggly lines? Yeah, I see it right now. Yeah, that's that's yeah, awful. Yeah, that's, that's, a shitty VHS tape. that's a shitty yeah, VHS. That's a shitty VHS. Yeah, it's a shitty VHS tape. It's terrible. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you see that during his promo, and then you don't see it again. So uh, at least you don't see it again. Once right, is too so, much. But this, is this Dusty Rhodes' first appearance in WWE with this promo? No, he's he's been he no he he did some some uh, superstars and some um, some fucking primetime wrestling already. Oh, okay. he's with the boss man. Yeah, because the quality is this not is his good. first pay per view. Yeah, because the quality is not good, I can't. And that's also because it's dusty. I can't really understand what the fuck he's saying. <laughs> but it's also not just the quality. It's like, it's like the fucking the tone and the accent he's using. I, he goes like, like when he's saying public, he's going public. <laughs> he goes public. But I, I feel like Vince made him exaggerate how he talks. Yeah, and he's such a caricature here. More so, more, more why so. Is he wearing he's... a cop cap, and why does he have like? Oh, he's playing with the boss man. He stole that from the boss man. Oh, okay. I did not. That happened not... on. That happened on superstars. Oh, they did not explain that. Um. 
So anyways, he does that promo, and we're going to go to match number two. It is the Honky Tonk Man with Jimmy Hart versus Dusty Rhodes. Uh, Dusty gets a big pop coming in. Uh, there is, during this match, there is a ref bump, and Jimmy Hart, uh, has the guitar and he's on the apron and he accidentally hits Honky Tonk Man instead of Dusty with the guitar and then Dusty drops the elbow for the win afterwards Sean Mooney, he starts interviewing Honky Tonk Man who is very loopy what did you think? I mean I thought it was fine, I thought it was a good like, this is the first like big Dusty Rhodes match and Vince had him go over, I thought it was fine, you know it um it was fine. It was fine for what it was. It wasn't. Yeah, it was fine for what it was. Yes. Yeah. Um, mean Gene, he is with Demolition and Jim Duggan. And Jim Duggan, he's also King Duggan, but he's also wearing a Demolition mask. He's like a, just a mixture of all these gimmicks. Mm-hmm. It is. Uh, that actually, actually would be a pretty fun gimmick if somebody is just taking a whole bunch of different gimmicks and putting it into one. Right. <laughs> so if he's like, wearing the Stone Cold Steve Austin vest, but he's got, like, the rock sunglasses, and he's got, like, I don't know, Triple H does that Triple H spring the water thing. Just, like, everything in mushed into one. <laughs> Apparently there was um, a Japanese wrestler like that. He would yell out a wrestler, then do the finishing move. Charlie Hot? No, it was, a Jap- yeah. it was a Japanese guy in Japan, and the reason, I remember, like, people thought that Eugene was going to steal that gimmick, because... Remember Eugene started hitting other people's moves? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. this I don't I don't know who the wrestler is. I don't know what company he worked for, but he would he was a comedy wrestler, but then he would yell out like Stan Hansen and then hit a perfect Larian, or he'd yell out Austin and hit a perfect like stunner. Or whoever the fuck. Maybe some, you know, Tokyo Doko, whatever the fuck those guys teams are. It was the great Muda. <laughs> was it? <laughs> All right, we're going to go to match number three. It's Mr. Perfect versus Red Rooster. It's a very short match. Mr. Perfect hits a perfect plex for a win in a very quick match. What did you think? Uh, wh- why, do you, why do you even hire? You know what? Bruce Pritchard always says that if, oh, if Terry Taylor really put himself behind the Red Rooster, he could have got it over. He could have got it over. It's like, bro, he was putting himself. It's such a dumb fucking gimmick. Like, just the yeah. hair. Terry Taylor really was trying his best. I, that's how I Yeah, like, it. what more do you want him to do? Like, dude, that hair. But, dude, like, just the hair, which I'm sure was Vince's idea, not his. He's just already done with that fucking hair, bro. Like, yeah. it's like, dude, why didn't you just fire this guy? Like, they must have. Dude, I'm telling you, they hire some people and then go out of the way to make sure that they can never really seriously become a star anywhere. And he was one of the guys they decided to do that to. This is the first clean match that we've seen. The and, first and yeah, matches. Um, this match was okay. Again, like not it, it's a, it was a showcase of Mr. Perfect, but it wasn't like this great like five star class. No, it's a TV match that shouldn't have been on the show, yeah. but they did it to get him over. I get. Yeah, it. they're trying to get Mr. Perfect over because also they're setting him up for a feud with Hogan soon. So yeah, uh, Mean Gene, he is with. Ravishing Rick Rude and Bobby Heenan. They talk about the warrior. They talk about the intercontinental title. And Heenan says they're going to break all the rules. It says, warrior, you don't need to worry about painting your face anymore. Because Rick Rude is going to beat your eyes black and blue. I was like, oh, that's pretty good. Pretty good promo. Mm-hmm. We're going to go to match number four. It is a six-man tag or trios match, if you will. The Rockers and Tito Santana versus Rick Martel and the Rougeau Brothers who come out with Slick and Jimmy Hart. The Rougeau's got this, the All-American Boys theme. It's very, Did they sing it? Yeah, they, they sing it. Yeah. They sang that one themselves. Okay, very interesting. All right. The, why do these guys always get, like, why does Jacques Rougeau constantly allow to sing his own theme? I think it's funny because he's bad and he's a heel. So, I yeah, mean, okay. Because he sings the Mountie one too. And I'm like, yeah, I but guess that's he's... also, he's horrible singing it too. And it makes, I remember as a kid, we were like, I'm the Mountie. Like, we would remember. Yeah, yeah. I, I used it to love that. Look dumber. Like, yeah. I, I mean, that's a way to get the guy over. Yeah. As a okay. big guy, as a guy you're supposed to find annoying. I wonder if there were like other wrestlers going, like, hey, how come he can sing his theme when I can't? <laughs> there Dude, they should have like MJF sing his theme and, and really badly. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think who can sing. Who can who's 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 got a team that actually got like words? Oh, like, they have just, Dominic. Dominic could sing a theme. Like Dominic should sing his theme. Yeah, amazing. Like the problem with a lot of the themes is like this song. 
I like this theme song. I think it's more yeah, yeah, the All American Boys. I liked it. Yes, it's a better theme song than what the than what MJF has. I think that that gimmick gets not only does it get them over his heels, but it's a cool song. It likes it's like let's go. It gets you pumped. Yeah, it's kind of catchy. Yeah, and I agree. It's ending with the Mountie song later on. So like, it's a good idea. You know, the problem is like MJF like constantly he thinks he's like the Mountie or he's like the Miz, but you know he's there yelling at telling. Did you see he told Adam Cole Keith Lee's manager and all that shit. Yes, I thought um, MJF this last week's Dynamite. He he was brutal to Adam. Yeah, Cole. and it's like, but like he needs to do stuff like like what what Jacques Rougeau is doing. He needs to like sing his own song. He needs to do. He needs to look like a doofus, and he doesn't want to do that. But then he I also if MJF should look like a doofus though. I He's think he champion. should. Doesn't matter. His character is like this conceited guy. A, a guy that conceited has to constantly be made to look stupid. Vince well, McMahon was stupid as a character. If he's not going to look stupid, then just make him a good guy. Yeah. yeah. I know what you're saying, but that, that's not a heel. If he's constantly... Well, like, Macho Man doesn't look stupid. He's a heel. Ma- Macho Man eventually. Yeah, Macho Man. Well, Macho Man loses. He hit his... Fi- I mean, just in this paper alone, he hits his finishing move, and Hogan gets right up. Yeah, that's true, but, I mean, he doesn't look stupid. Stupid. But he no. still looks stupid. I mean, that's his best move, and Hogan just doesn't was like I know it does nothing. Yeah, I know. I will get into that later. But yeah, but like I'm just saying, like you have to do things like that. Like anyway, you have to look stupid. That's the point, guys. And here's the sad part: if you said to MJF, you need to study Jacques Rougeau, you would probably uh-huh. like put a right on you how stupid you are, not knowing how stupid he is. Anyway. Yeah. All right. So most of this match is basically Tito Santana getting worked on, getting uh, the heat put on him. Tito is such a good speller. The facials okay. he makes and stuff. I think, you know, when I was watching this, I was like, this is probably why Tito Santana was never a, like a heel. You know? Mm-hmm. He's always been a good guy his entire run. I think it's because he gets so much sympathy. He gets so much sympathy. By the way, you, you don't want to boo him. Uh, there was yeah, never you never want to boo him. You know? There's never a moment in um, entire life, in my entire life, where I got annoyed by him or I'm like, or I want him to lose. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I may be like, this match is boring. I wish it would end. But I don't want him to, like, get beat up. So that's that says a lot. I I hate to say this, but Tito Santana is, like, a constant B student. And mm-hmm. the fact that, like, he's a good student. He's, like, always going to be at B level. But he's never going to be, like, that A quality. But you, you need people like that sometimes. Yeah, you need people like that. And you still, like, you still respect some of that because he's very consistent. You the know? thing about it is, is that with a guy like Tito, is like when they did give him a push, people bought it, and he could go back and forth. You know, remember, um, he was when they were gonna make the move in '92 to Brett, he was the other candidate. Yeah, I think people, people probably would have no, no, people wouldn't have been like that's stupid. People would have been like, oh, I guess Tito Santana is, is has leveled up if he became the champion. I think they could have done it to Tito because he was constantly like just he was he was upper mid card to lower card constantly and yeah. you can put them anywhere you need guys like that now yeah. if anybody goes a little bit lower the fans are like oh it's, it's over he's buried yeah by the way tito santana and rick martel they had broken up at wrestlemania 5 which was on april 2nd so this is like five months and they're still feuding and i was like wow what is this swerve and keith lee why are they still fighting? at least they're actually <laughs> fighting yeah these guys are actually fighting anyway yeah. There is a huge pop for the hot tag because people really love the Rockers. And I actually remember when I was a kid, I really, really liked the Rockers. I thought they were the, I thought they were I liked them better than the Heart Foundation, actually. Wow. Yeah, um, a lot of kids did. A lot of kids did. Yeah, yeah. There's so this is a good match, but at the end, there's some confusion. Like nobody knows who the legal man is because it's six man. There, there are people are everywhere. And Marty Janetti, he basically rolls up Jacques Rougeau, but while the referee is distracted, once again. Uh, Rick Martel hits Marty Janetti in the throw, and Marty falls over to me. Uh, cover him for the win. A very good match. Very disorganized finish. I think they screwed up the finish a little bit somewhere, but I like the match. They, yeah, it was good. It was really good. You had six great workers. You know, the Rougels are very underrated. They're great. Rick Martel, 
it was a really fun six man match. I remember being very annoyed that the Rockers and Tito lost, but when I was a kid, but it was fun. It was a good match. Yeah, I mean, I, second best match on the show. I feel like they should have had the Rockers win this match. The Rockers should have won. I mean, it worked out. It worked yeah, out. it worked. Well, not for Shawn Michaels. Is, Shawn Michaels is probably eating out Tiffany Stratton right now. Um, tonight in the back. So it worked out, but like I would have had the Rockers get at least one title reign, but it is. Yeah, I, I would have as well. I would have as well. It's, uh, not like, it's not like Shawn Michaels is at a fucking armory right down around, but he's doing pretty. What good. about Martin Gennetti? Well, yeah, it didn't work out for him, you know. Tony Schiavone, he uh, runs down the history between Rick Rude and uh, Warrior. Uh, these two just these two have also been feuding since January 1989. So yeah. the Royal Rumble, I believe, is when it started. And I was like, man, this is such a long feud. This is not going to fly today. Um, well, but also they didn't have pay-per-views to fill. They, they yeah, just didn't exactly. Finish. Yeah. Uh, so me and Gene, he's with Warrior. And, dude, Warrior sounds like like Cookie Monster in the beginning. I didn't understand what the hell he was saying. And then something about the gods above is what I got. I couldn't understand the other stuff. It was really I was like, I was like, what is it saying? I didn't understand. Mm-hmm. But it's going to lead to match number five for the Intercontinental title. Rick Rude, the champion with Bobby Heenan versus the Warrior. Warrior runs out. You know, he's doing this fucking thing going 100 miles per hour. The crowd is going crazy. And, dude, he is really – you know what? He is very cool here. And you know what he reminded See, that's, that's me of? That's my favorite – I this is my favorite um uh outfit of his, this color scheme. Yeah, the green, the neon green. You know what? Yeah. You know what uh, Ultimate Warrior reminded me of? He reminded me of like those eighties, like those action figure cartoons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You no, know, like he's got the tassels. He's super muscular. Mm-hmm. He's got the cool rock music intro. Like he reminds me of like the Ninja Turtles mixed with like the Thundercats and He Man, like all into one. You know, there's no way you could not be a fan of this guy. He was like, you know, for all the wrestlers, like he, some of these old wrestlers shit on him, and it's like, bro, like. You don't know what it was like to be a kid. You were in your 30s and 40s back then. You don't know what it was like to be a kid. As a yeah. kid, this guy caught your attention. And, dude, the kids at my school, every kid, whether they loved him or they hated him, they talked about him all the time. So I would say these rewatches has changed my opinion on – you can add him to the list for the people I've yes. changed my opinion on. Yeah. And he also, yes, because they constantly – the other thing is they, they he's another guy they try to paint as someone who is not a good worker. And and I know last year it was a very short match, but this is the second – two summer slams in a row. He's had the best match on the show. So Is he, like, the best wrestler in the world? No, but he's not, like – he's not a buffoon either, you know? It's not dull. His matches are not dull, except for wrestling. No, no, he's not. Yeah, they're not dull. He's a good worker. He's not a great wrestler. He's a good worker. It's like, it's like, it's like a spectacle. Yeah, yeah, that's what I want. I don't. Yeah, exactly. I agree. So in this match, uh, they're on the outside. There's a point in this match when they're outside, and Warrior fucking grabs the title belt and he hits Rick Rude with it, like right in front of the referee. And Jesse Ventura is going ballistic. He's like, "What? Is this is not." I almost feel like he wasn't supposed to do that. And the referee's yeah. like, oh, "Whatever." Yeah, that that kind of shows kind of Warrior is kind of stupid sometimes. Tony Schiavone tries to like cover it up, saying, "Well, you know, it happened on the outside. It doesn't count." And it's you know, like, it's really you funny. about the outside. Yeah, it, it was really funny. Is that remember before this, Bobby Heenan cut a promo about how they're gonna break all the rules of cheating. Yeah, and Warrior is doing that. Um, this match is all right, and it's going. And then there's a ref bump again. There's another one. This is a theme of the night. Almost like every single match, the ref it happens. The finish mm-hmm. happens with the ref getting bumped or distracted. That's why I don't like this paper rule. And basically, um, while the ref is out, the ref is out for a long time. Warrior is, like, covering him, but there's the, no ref. There's even a point where Warrior goes to the referee and, like, slaps him in the face. Yeah. <laughs> That's Gorilla Monsoon's son. He just, like, slapped him in the face. Piper comes down to the ring for some reason. And he moons Rick Rude, which distracts Rick Rude enough to the point where Warrior can, like, gorilla press him and then hit that Warrior splash for the win. And now the Warrior is now the two-time Intercontinental Champion. Uh, what did you think, my man? I liked it a lot. So Bobby Heenan and Roddy Piper were feuding on primetime wrestling. And that's why Piper came out. They were, like, they were like feuding on primetime. Um, I liked it a lot. I thought they both – I thought, you know – 
when you take they were on they were on they they were on the road since WrestleMania wrestling on all the house shows, right? So yeah. I didn't like their WrestleMania five match. I was actually shocked how much I didn't like it. This match is so because this is what I remember. I remember them having really good matches. Um, Rick Rude really, I I mean I don't know what if Ultimate Warrior thanked him in his Hall of Fame speech, but Ultimate Warrior should thank that guy till the end of time because he is such a better worker from WrestleMania five to this show. I'm talking about Ultimate Warrior, and it's all thanks to Rick Rude. You know what I mean? Yeah, I agree. I think working with someone like Rick Rude probably it can only make you better. You know, the thing about it is this is why house shows are important. If you have a guy who's not the best, but you want to push him, if you have him constantly practicing with someone like a Rick Rude, and right now I say, let's say Finn Balor's Rick Rude, right? So if you have like this young, like let's say um, Braun Breaker, you want Braun Breaker to be like the next big thing or whatever. If you have Braun and Finn wrestling on house shows all the time, Braun's going to get better. And then yeah. when you put him on TV for his series for his big match, problem is now everything there's so many so much of their shit is televised. It's hard for them to get these reps that the Warrior got, where that no one really saw. You know what I mean? You know, uh, this is probably needed more so in AEW than anything, yeah. which is why they started doing those house shows originally. Yeah. Well, that's why people say that's why Sky Blue got better because she wrestled in all the house shows. People, I haven't really watched her, but people said she has gotten better. And she was like one of the only talents that was on every house show. Oh, it's too bad you didn't watch, you didn't finish Rampage because she actually. She won. I know she Dude, I think that was like the first time I ever saw her win. Well, see, she's got to win something. I mean, I mean. Dude, it was, it was so like. People, people. I, did, I don't think I've ever won. seen her win until then. Yeah. People did say when she went, like she's been improving. And someone said the reason why she's improved is like she's one of the only people who did the house shows, did every house show. Like a lot of them did it. And I'm like, that makes sense. If she's getting more reps, she is going to get better, you know? Yeah, yeah, um, it's like, yeah, 100%. And I also <laughs> like the fact that Roddy Piper interfered. You know, I kind of was very down on his return. And between WrestleMania now, he's not doing anything. And now Piper's in a feud with a great bad guy. And there's potential. I mean, it doesn't really happen, but there's potential to make him relevant again. You know what I'm saying? Like now yeah, he's well, in a real feud. Well, we'll talk about Piper because it's coming up. There is going to be a long backstage segment. I actually would like it if they kept doing stuff like this. You got Mean Gene, he's in the back with Mr. Perfect. And Mr. Perfect basically takes his time to, like, crapple over Red Rooster, saying he and was just a that he's going to um, gonna fight Vince. Yeah, yeah. This was just a stepping stone, and he's going for the top. Very good promo by Mr. Perfect. But as soon as Mr. Perfect leaves, Gene is still standing there, and Piper just shows right up. And Piper, he's like drinks some water and he dribbles it out of his mouth like an idiot. He says, I like Pete Rose and maybe I'm going to drive the Voyager 3. I don't understand what the fuck he's talking about. It's he, Gene is trying to ask him a question and he won't even let him talk. Who's this? This is Roddy Piper. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Roddy Piper. Yes, yes. Roddy Piper. Yeah. He, Dude, just... he comes in. He's like, hey, look at me drink water. And he like doesn't drink. He like lets him drip out of his mouth. I didn't get that. He goes, I like Pete Rose. I didn't get that. He goes, maybe I'll drive the Voyager 3. I don't know. I don't understand any of that. What and is these all like references to whatever was going on in the news at the time? It's so stupid, man. It's so stupid. Um, but I did like the final, the final line. I thought it was good. I'm gonna go get rude. Like I thought um, that was a good. Wow. So he starts like mentioning, like, hey, you know what a Scott man have under his skirt? And he's all over the place. He's very annoying. I wish he was still actually not in this company anymore. And I don't like that last line where he says, I'm going to go get rude. You know why? Because he mentioned it like three fucking times. Bro. He goes, okay. I, like, I like I'm the, the, the way he delivered the last line. Hink, wink, wink. But there is, you're right. There, there is something. Do you think like he had an overdose and nobody knew? Like there's something missing from it. There's something weird about it. And yeah. he's not like early 80s Roddy Piper. He's just really dumb, man, right? It, it's like, and, it's almost like 20 years after. I always say this, but now you're watching these shows, it's almost like 20 years or something have passed between WrestleMania 3 and whoever this guy is. Because it doesn't even feel like the same guy. It's only two years, it's only two years apart. He is by far probably my least favorite part of the show. He wow. really was. I really could not stand him. I could not stand his stupid promo. It made no sense. The only other person I couldn't stand more than this guy, actually, there's two more people. I actually one. Jimmy Snooker, and that's because he's a murderer. Really, like, 
So let's let's keep going. So Roddy Piper. Okay, you so want then to... Roddy Piper leaves, and then Ronnie Garvin shows up in a tuxedo, and he's standing with uh, with um, Gene, and Gene's like, "Hey, why are you wearing a tuxedo?" Before he could explain, he leaves, and then fucking Bobby Heenan shows up, and he's yeah, mad about what out, Piper Arnold. did. And then Rick Rude comes out, and they're both mad, and they're fucking furious. And I'm glad, like you know, you know, if Gene had told them, you know, Roddy Piper likes Pete Rose, they probably would have fucking lost it. But yeah. they're just mad, and then they run off, and Gene goes, all right, we're going to take a five-minute intermission. But I really like this, how there was, like, a constant revolving door. Yeah, and it's basically broke. setting up, but it's also setting up, like, all the future storylines. Oh, yeah, they should do this more often. They should just have, because like... now you know, like, it's now Piper and Rude. Yeah, yeah, but what I mean is, like, they should do this thing where, like, if you have, let's say, AEW... And it's like Alex Marvez is standing in the back. Someone should cut in, do a promo, like one, like half a step, half a minute, leave, and then somebody else just comes in right and it away. Also, and just, it also gives yeah. the audience, because listen, the AW pay per views are nine hours anyway. Might as well give the audience like a few minutes to like get up, you know, before the next matches, calm down, get all themselves, and also establish some new storylines going in. Yeah. You know, and they have plenty of idiots who could say nonsense like fucking body pipe. So yeah. they, they should do that. Anyway. After break, Gene's back and he gives a recap of what's going on with Team Hogan, Zeus, Macho Man, and the Beefcake and the conflict and everything that's going on. I was looking this up because I actually never seen Zeus wrestle before. Zeus, Zeus even wrestled. Yeah, I know. What? I know that. He, did you know that this is according to Wikipedia? He's had a movie out every year since 1985 all the way to 2022. Every year he's got a movie out. Yeah, and he and, was also in Dark Knight. Yeah, this is the first year that he does not have a movie out because he passed away in 2020. But he's had a movie out even after he died, 2021, 2022. He's been in this kind of film, right? Yeah. It's the first year he's not. However, he is still in uh, WWE 2K23 this year. So this guy, he, nobody can stop him. He's constantly working. Right? Oh, he's the man. <laughs> he's the man. He's this guy. Zeus is just like constantly working. But it's incredible. He's been in like every you know some actors they there's a gap right where they're not in, they don't have a film out this guy's had a film out like granted they're all we'll, 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 all talk, over, but... we'll talk about zeus when we get to the main event but mm -hmm. i gotta say um i think the experiment was successful it could have been a lot worse you know yeah it wasn't the best He's, but it could have been a lot he worse. stayed with me all these years and when they announced when i see figures of him like they're putting out an elite figure if i can get that on sale i'm buying that zeus figure He's no right. bad bunny, right? But, but in a way, he's more memorable. To, like, are kids that are eight going to still remember? I mean, they're going to remember Bad Bunny for the music, but for the wrestling. No, I mean, like, for the wrestling, he, his, you know what's great about Zeus is that the presentation is just amazing. Presentation is fantastic. Oh, and, like, fantastic. the idea that this guy couldn't get out, couldn't separate the movie. Like, yeah. and the idea that, like, almost like they just cast this lunatic to be in the movie and he, and he still thinks he's in the movie. I don't know. It was like, it was like a good way to make the way they did it made that movie seem better to me. My because I finally rewatched. I saw it in the theaters and I really liked it, but I never rewatched it until like my twenties. It's really fucking bad, but because of the way they did these angles, it in my memory it was like that was a really good movie. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah. All right, so we're gonna go to match number six. This is the uh, another six man tag. We got the twin towers of Big Boss Man and Akeem and Andre the Giant with Slick versus Demolition and Jim Duggan. There's a fan in the audience who has a sign that says Demolition will topple the twin towers. And you got the World Trade Center, like kind of like. Planted. Did you ever hear someone someone say that was? Um, there's a theory out there for these, you know, because people say the U.S. government blew up the twin towers. Yeah, that that was someone who knew what they were going to do. And they were mocking like everyone what the plan was for twelve years from now. That little kid with the demolition. Yeah, that the family knew. The family's in on it. I mean, I was gonna say the kid's half right. It wasn't demolition on <laughs> top of it. But anyway, oh, I'm gonna get canceled in Malaysian. Um. Oh, by the way, the Malaysian government has contacted Interpol to uh, track down to get Jocelyn Chia. Soft people, soft, super soft. Anyway. Those are, those are so, the most dangerous people, though. But anyway, let's keep going. Yeah. Jim yeah. Duggan, he's still wearing a demolition face mask. And when he takes it off, he's got the American flag face I like that. 
Yeah, it reminded me of a uh, Nuke, a, a Marvel. Comics you know what nuke. I like about it too? It's like he's. It's like, it's like a fun variation to what Demolition is doing. Yes. Rather than just be there like Hacksaw Jim Duggan. I think they. I think they. They either are making a figure or they did make a figure of this. They did make a figure. Wrong. They did already. But, yeah. Yeah, I think that's. I think you know, little things like this. They need to do this more because it just creates like awesome figures and stuff. It's very. It's a very smart idea what Hacksaw did. If you're trying to think of what it is like in today's equivalent, it's kind of like, you know, when CM Punk came out with Sting and Darby Allin? Which I loved, yeah. I, yeah, I cool. loved it when he had the his own face paint, but it was like Chicago's colors. But it was stuff. also like classic Sting rather than... Yeah, there's classic Sting, but with Chicago theme on it. I, yeah. It's kind of like what this is. I like that. Yeah, absolutely. I like that shit. Yeah, I like shit like that too, brother. Anyways, um, Bobby Heenan arrived during this match. During this match, there is a distracted referee. Uh, and while the referee's distracted, allows Jim Duggan to use his American flag colored two by four on Akeem. And he rolls smash on top of him for the win. Another distracted ref finish. Uh, eh. I mean, this is a huge match as far as everybody's in there. The room's massive. This match. Um, yeah, this match is, uh, dude, I feel like, I feel like so bad for Andre the Giant watching these. He really should have just retired at WrestleMania three. Like, this is a very really, short match, though. I know, but like just watching him walk to the ring with the other two guys, he just looks so like, like. Do you really like need him in this match? Like, do you really need him to put his body through this? I don't know. It's just like, and I know, like, he didn't want to retire. Do you think he wanted to be in part of it? Like, that's exactly. probably why. Yeah, it's probably more. But it's why. like so sad. It's like. Yeah, I didn't realize how sad it was until when I was a kid, but it really is sad. Yeah, when I'm a kid, I don't really realize this, but you see him in this match, like, he's really leaning on the ropes, you know, and just, like, he's on the apron for a majority of the time, yeah. And then uh, then they lose, so it's like... Yeah, and they lose, yeah, and it's, uh, eh, eh, you know. It is what it is. Anyways, Mean Gene, he is with Ted DiBiase, who cuts a promo on Jimmy Snuka. And he talks about Jimmy Snuka being a primitive native eating coconuts. And I'm just like, yee! <laughs> I was like, ugh! I was kept that in. Yeah, I know. I was surprised they kept that in. The guy is Jimmy Snuka. He is a, He's a murderer or whatever. Yeah, whatever. yeah. I think that's the reason why they excused it. Ronnie Garvin. He finally explains why and he finally explained why he's wearing a tuxedo, which I still did like because it's a little bit of foreshadowing instead of actually just telling press right away. He's the ring announcer. And um, Jesse Ventura informed so us. So at the time, he had lost a retirement match with Greg Valentine. So, so he kept coming back in odd jobs to torment Greg Valentine. Which yes, I thought was actually Jesse Ventura on commentary kind of lets us know this. Like, this guy was banned as a referee and as a wrestler. Take notes, Excalibur. Just little fucking things like that. And that's all you got to do, right? You got to give a little bit of background. He's anyway. Dead. Uh, this is for match. He is the ring announcer for match number seven. It's Hercules versus Greg Valentine. Who comes out with, with Jimmy Hart. Garvin, the whole time while he's uh, announcing Greg Hammer, uh, he is just making fun of him. And he even calls him Jimmy Hart, Little Jimmy. That's where that, 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 Maybe that's the first time we ever hear Little Jimmy. Our truth and, heard that. I was like, we got an idea. Yeah. Um, surprisingly, there is no ref bump or distracted ref in this finish. But it does include the shittiest finish that I fucking hate. This is like when they're in the corner and the heel fucking trips the fucking good guy. And then he puts his feet on the fucking corners for that shitty corner cover. I fucking hate this finish. But that's how Greg the Hammer Valentine wins. Afterwards, Garvin keeps saying Hercules won. And fucking Hammer attacks Garvin and Garvin and him fight and whatever. Uh, what did you think? I mean, as as a way to continue the Ronnie Garvin angle, it's fine. As a match, it stunk. But Ronnie Garvin, even though he's not really good on the, on the mic, was pretty funny. I mean, no, I thought some parts of it was pretty pretty okay. Yeah, yeah. they were all. And right. the way he like he kept saying like uh like he just went like no actually Hercules won. Yeah, yeah. I thought yeah. that was funny. And then like and then he explains sort of what happened. He goes, yeah, now Hercules won by disqualification because I fucking told the ref that you cheated. I thought that was funny. That was smart. You know what I mean? Dude, what do you um? Can I ask you? how you feel about Ronnie Garvin. I mean, he had a good match with Ric Flair, um, but other than that, I think he is a mid-carder. But he, he's funny. He's kind of like he, goofy. I don't think they ever really... He's so vanilla never, to me. 
they never really well i think he could have been interesting but they never really took advantage of him i don't know what you could have done with him yeah i'm trying to think like they i mean like yeah he was like in the i main think event, giving him the, the title i think giving him the way that match was good but rick flair made him look like an idiot in that match um i think giving him the title kind of fucked him because he got it too soon and Ric Flair made him look an idiot on a huge show. So, like, I don't know. But, you know, it's, it's, he's a pilot. I don't, I don't see anything in Ronnie Garvin. I don't like his, I don't think his looks anything. He has no, I look. think, I think what happened was because they gave him the belt that made, you know, that put him in a position where you, where you really scrutinize him. Like, if Hercules beat Hogan and had the belt, you would really be looking at Hercules now. You know what I mean? I see what you're saying. Yeah, All it's right. like, he, like, um, right, right now we're not really paying attention to Marty Jannetty, but if they made Marty Jannetty like the centerpiece of of the promotion in 1989, I don't think he was ready. I don't think he was ever ready. You would see a lot of his flaws in his game. He like I don't know. It's just like they 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 didn't book him properly. I, I there was a place for him. I don't know where it was though. I just he, yeah, you know I just, what? yeah, it's over. I mean, yeah, not it's it, gone. So I see nothing in him. That's why. Uh, anyway, and he saw nothing in himself. That's why he became a pilot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Did he become I a pilot? I agree. Wasn't I want to go to the pilot. Isn't Jimmy Garvin? I guess they're all pilots. That's they're his king pilot. brother. That's not his real brother, by the way. Oh, it's not even his real brother. All right. Um, mean Gene, he is with Zeus, Macho Man, and Sherry Martell. And they are with a cult. And Sherry Martell is now a fortune teller. No, she she's a witch. Really, she's a witch. She can really be in any role. Because so far, we've seen her play like. Like a Nate, like a fifties doo wop girl, which she did well. She's done everything pretty well. Sherry is just multi talented. And Sherry, um, you know how they like to prop up Mula and May Young all the time. Yeah, that that should be Sherry. Sherry, you know, like what, dude? I was listening to the Laps fan. They were talking about the Wendy Richter Mula situation. Dude, Mula is the every time you like listen about Mool, like it's it's like what a piece of shit like she kind of ruined female wrestling for years you know what I mean? for years yeah. she's i don't did there's still things that we don't know that dude if, if if like some of these women before they die just revealed everything that they know i think vince would be in jail that's how bad mula is basically mula is like a genuine monster but because the dad was in bed with her vince had to be in bed with her too but I think Mula is everything Vince is, but 20 times worse. You know what I'm saying? I really do. She is a fucking monster. And I think Sherry should be the woman that every company celebrates as the pioneer, as a woman who could do everything. I think um, when it said the Mae Young Classic, it should be the, the, Sher- the Sensational Invitational. I think Sherry should be the woman that like... That that basically like you know oh she's like they treat how Bruno for the men or they treat Hogan for the men. I think I, I know what you're saying because I agree. Sherry Martell should mm-hmm. be more revered as a legend than any other female. It, uh, it should WWE be like superstar. the I women were fine. Be, she should be the top like mentioned yeah. female legend at WWE. I really believe it should that. be it should be like she's talking about like in hushed tones like what a let and they don't for some reason they don't and and they they finally gave up Mula because people people like called Snickers. Remember people were calling Snickers and being like remember they called the fabulous Mula yeah, battle. Yeah role? of course yeah I remember the this. Fact that they, he was they were still... doing it was called the Mula classic and they changed it to the May Young classic or something like that, right? Yeah yeah the fact that he was still all about Mula up until like that far in is like fucking crazy bro because he Dude, like she really, and I think she heard Vince's pocket too because he had to like bow to her, which is so fucking weird that he bowed to anyone, and he had to chase out Wendy Richter because they didn't get along, and the way she fucked, she basically ruined Wendy Richter's life, and I think she also cost Vince money because Vince could have been making the money he makes off Becky and Sasha Banks probably forty years ago, you know what I mean? And yeah, um, I wonder if uh, maybe. Junior doesn't like her was because maybe she went to WCW. So, so did everybody else. Yeah, uh, I know, but you know, he's a weirdo like that. It's something, it's something, it's it's something. But you know what the other thing too is like, and we can say, oh, the talent wasn't there for a Becky Lynch or Sasha Banks. And it's like, well, yeah, the talent wasn't there because Bula controlled everybody. If these women had different trainers, or Vince could get behind these women without Mula, 
there might have been a Becky Lynch or Sasha Banks in 1988. You know well, what I'm saying? Of course. The yeah. Japanese wrestling scene could have been the huge. American wrestling scene. Yeah, well, you know? uh, yeah, like, they were like pop stars. They were like Britney Spears and the fucking, you know, your brothers, um, BTS. They were huge over there. Yeah. Well, do you know why Japanese rest, female wrestling is as good as it is? Because, because Mildred Burke, mm-hmm. when she was like uh, the top female wrestler in America and her ex-husband controlled all the uh, women's wrestling and when they when they got divorced he blocked her and said you're not gonna i control yeah, all of the women's wrestling. Took everything, so yeah. she went over to japan and then she trained everybody and that's why yeah. they're and so they, they were, were so good and, and they yeah. were making money hand over fist back then so you could have done it in the united states you really, and it was all because of this one woman who to this day bruce pritchard like defends her and it's like she was holding back an entire other half of this art form. Just this one fucking person. It's fucking wild to me. So, like, anyway, this promo was great. Sherry is a legend among legends, and she should have a fucking statue at the Performance Center. I agree. She should be way more celebrated than she is. Yeah. Um, by the way, while we were talking, I did look it up. Both Ronnie and Jimmy Garvin are pilots. Yes. You were right about that. And here's the thing. Jimmy Garvin is actually Ronnie Garvin's stepson. What? <laughs> That's they couldn't say that because it would make them it would make one of them look older. So yeah. All right, we're gonna go to match number eight. It is Ted DiBiase with Virgil. Uh and Ted DiBiase gets in the mic and he says he ended Jake Roberts' career. Uh he's talking about that and then he DiBiase is gonna face Jimmy Snooker. Jimmy Snooker, uh there's a point in this match where he mistimes a fucking reverse sleep oh. frog. Fucking lands right on DiBiase. Oh, that, that was one of the worst botches I've seen so far. I think that's the moment where Vince gave up on both guys. Possibly, but that's more like a snooker thing. You that's know? more a snooker thing, but it was so bad. It was so bad. Yeah, the weird thing about sometimes making it when a, a mistake happens in the ring, sometimes both guys get blamed for it, even though it's like a one person thing. That's weird. Dude, it was like it was so bad, like they really couldn't really recover from it. Like it just looks they, they both look like they didn't know what they were doing. And I understand it's more Snooker's fault, but you get what I'm saying. No, I agree. I agree. Uh so basically Jimmy, Jimmy Snooker goes outside to fight Virgil and then DBS rams him into the post, and Jimmy Snooker cannot get back in to be the 10 count. So DiBiase wins, but afterwards Snooker attacks both DiBiase and does this super fly splash on Virgil. Afterwards, for the win, not for the win, just to please the fans, this match should not have been on this team. Well, I think he wanted to, I think he thought, like, I want to, I re-signed Snooker. Snooker was, dude, Snooker in 83 was as big as, it was about as big as Hogan was, right? He was huge. He was a huge star, right? Which isn't that far off, if you think about it, from where we are in 83. 83, 82, Snooker was a massive star. He was the top face in the company before they signed Hogan. And um, so he was also, I think Vince was like, I want to give Snooker another chance. Maybe he can recapture that magic. He was super over in New Jersey. He was super over in New York. Um, But it was over. Snooker didn't have it anymore. The best thing, when you look back, the best thing Snooker ever did was start the streak. Start the what? Streak, yeah. Start the streak. Yeah, possibly. Mm -hmm. All right, Sean Mooney, he is uh, sitting in the cheap seats. This time, he fucking doesn't insult them for being so poor, but he's talking about the great view. Well, Gorilla did that. Tony Schiavone knows enough to, like, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, Sean Mooney did it, too. He was like, I'm here with the cheap seats. <laughs> they stopped doing that. Oh, yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right. Yeah. Um, mean Gene is with uh, Hogan and Beefcake, and Hogan's promo is kind of all over the place. Is this something weird? Everyone's promo is just, like, all over the place. I don't know what the hell they're talking about a lot of times. Mm-hmm. Um, and then before we go to the main event, you get the genius. He's in the ring and he reads a poem about this main event. This poem stinks, by the way. It doesn't rhyme at all. It's just... I don't think it's a joke. He's also supposed to be an annoying idiot. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, he was, it was very weird. I didn't like it. Uh, I didn't like the genius being here like this. But... Mm-hmm. Well, he's also Randy's brother. They had to give him something. Yeah, I think that's probably like a Macho Man favorite thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's a good gimmick. I think it's a good gimmick where like there's this guy, obnoxious guy who calls himself a genius and he reads like a shitty poem. I just no, I don't know. It's a good. It just that poem. That poem was a good. There. Um. 
there is a couple of promos from the early 80s where Lanny and Randy are a tag team. And they were really good together as a tag team. And I would have had Lanny with Randy more. Especially like as Randy got older. when Instead of putting Randy in commentary, I would have had them be a tag team. Yeah. I think that would have been. So because like Lanny is just like this goofy guy. He's like this goofy, but he's kind of a little bit more serious than he is in WWF. So he's kind of like this like goofy kind of like, you know, fruity guy. And then Randy is in the back, like, and it's like, oh, this guy, Lanny, like this guy, Lanny, you don't think he's a threat, but he's got this guy as his fucking brother. And this guy's going to destroy you. So it's like these two fucking weirdos. And it really, it really fits, bro. Like it's they were, dynamic. it's a very it's good a dynamic. Great dynamic. And I, instead of, instead of like, dude, if you, I would have said, let's make you guys a tag team again. And I think they would have got over. I think as I, I think heal, right. I think that would have probably gotten over if they were attacked. I don't know. Yeah. Like Vince, I think the biggest mistake Vince made in the nineties, and I mean it, it all worked out, was giving up on Hogan and Savage way too fast. Yeah, I think so. I mean, yeah, he, he almost lost it all because he did that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And these guys were like, I don't even. They were in their forties. They were just yeah. They just I think Hogan just hit forty one and. You know, the other thing, too, and, like, I saw – I, I know we're not talking about NWA, but before we keep going, I want to mention this. Fucking – I see – I saw this thread the other day about how, like, after men hit 35, their bodies fall apart. Can I just tell you something? Like, watching Ric Flair for 89, he's 40 uh, in all these matches we're seeing, right? He is in the best shape of his life. His work rate is peak. He was never a better worker before. And I don't know how long he's going to be this great of a worker. He's not that great of a worker in 94. You know what I'm saying? So this is like the peak of his fucking athleticism. There's nobody that can compete with him in the 89 roster in WWE. You know what I'm saying? In terms of work rate. So it's like, don't give up on these fucking guys when they hit 40. Like, this is when you're going to see the if, if, if these guys, if Roman Reigns and Seth Rollins are even half of as good as, as Ric Flair was in 89, you're going to have some fucking classics in, while they're in their 40s. So it's just like this whole thing of like, oh, they hit 40, got to give up on them. Fucking dumb, you know? And if you're in AEW, don't give up on them when they're in their 50s either. No, you should give up on them when they're in their 50s. So they give up. <laughs> All right, but I think, from, I think you can still have great – I think you can be a great worker up until you're like 52. Yeah, I think so. All right, let's go to uh, the main event. It is Macho Man and Zeus with Sherry versus – Hogan and Beefcake, yeah, during the entrances, you see this kid cosplayed as Beefcake. That's how over Beefcake was. It was pretty good cosplay. I love Beefcake. Everyone sleeps on that. Before the match begins, Hogan starts whispering to Howard Finkel, and Howard Finkel introduces Miss Elizabeth, who comes up to a huge fucking pop. Basically, uh, the gist of this match, right, uh, is Zeus, he no-sells, and then he puts you in a bear hug, right? Yeah. Like, you punch him, you do all this stuff, he doesn't sell it. He only sells eye pokes, right? And he puts you in a bear hug. That's, That's all he soft. does. That's soft. Like, There's soft little eyeballs, so that. Yeah, yeah. That's, yes. That's why, even though one's wonky, it's still soft, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a point where Beefcake has a sleeper on Zeus, but then Macho Man hits him with a loaded purse, and Beefcake's out, and they fucking just work all over him, work on it, work on it. Eventually, Hogan gets in, and then he fucking gets hit with a fucking savage elbow, which he no sells. He just pops up right away. <laughs> he shit made me laugh. Macho Man hit his fucking finisher in a fucking perfect. Up, and he just gets right up. We just got right up. And then, and then Hogan and Zeus have a fucking no sell where they decide who can no sell the best. <laughs> and there's a point where Zeus. He gets hit with a clothesline and he goes down to one knee and then he's like, I'm not selling anymore. And he gets back up. Right? And then Hogan's working on him and then fucking Sherry gets on the apron. Liz fucking shoves her. It's the ring. There's some chaos. Savage gets on the turnbuckle. He's got the loaded purse, but Beefcake trips him up. And then Hogan, it gets the purse. And while the ref is distracted, he hits fucking Zeus with the loaded purse, hits the body slam and the leg drop on Zeus. For the win, as soon as the fucking rest counts to three, Hogan looks up and Liz is about to like 
fucking hit him with a loaded person. He cut, catches. Oh, Sherry, red- Sherry, Sherry. Sherry, sorry. He catches Sherry red handed. He fucking grabs her by the throat. He's got his fist up. I was like, what the fuck? Oh, and no. They did that to Sherry all the time. Sherry always yeah, got beat. I thought he was going to like knock her in the face. Instead, he just gives like this atomic drop where everyone can see her ass for a very long time. And then he fucking atomic drops her into Liz, who fucking hits her with the loaded purse. And then. Brutus picks out the scissor and they start cutting off her fucking ponytail. Then like, my favorite part was when after all this is happening, Hogan takes her ponytail, her cut off ponytail, and he puts it on top of his bald spot. <laughs> oh, it was true. <laughs> it was so funny. Oh, that was like the funniest thing since I've seen since Jim Duggan's Booger. Yeah, oh, it's fantastic. You know what? Like, I, uh... Zeus is super limited. But you can't, I dare you to watch this match and say it's not entertaining. Dude, you know? this is the third best match on the show. I didn't think this match was going to hold up, um, and it did. For, for Zeus being an actor who does, who, who I said in here, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing when I'm in there, right? Yes, yes. Um, I have no clue. He didn't take the training. He's not fucking Bad Bunny. He's not Logan Paul. He's barely Mr. T. Um, for all that, I thought this was even a better match than WrestleMania 1 main event. I thought this was a really good match. Because you know why? Savage is just the GOAT. And he, Savage is basically the Tasmanian double. He's running around, and it makes it seem like him and Zeus are, it's all him. Zeus is just like standing there. It's fucking great. I I thought this match was great. I loved when Hogan, can I just tell you, I thought of this. When Roman does lose the belt, I want the person he's fighting to know something like that. I want like oh, let's say like Zeus, no sell like Zeus. No, no, no sell like Hogan. I want, I want him to hit Cody with three spears next, row, and then Cody just stands up and hits his finisher on Roman and pins him. Like, yeah, it's a little, it's a little like it fucking makes you laugh when he. Fucking it's also exciting. Like what? It's also to me, it's exciting. Like to me, like if they did that to Roman, it would be like, all right, we we've teased you enough. We're gonna give you the finish you want. Here we go. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's it is it's just it's kind of funny. Uh it's a little you know what like you know what it is? I think if it was anybody else, it would have worked because it's it, because it's Hogan, it works, you know, it's oh, Hogan. Yeah, dude. Oh, if Hogan could still move, he can he could probably no sell rock blasters at five like that. Dude, you, if you want to if you want to see how good of a worker Hogan is, this is actually the best match to watch. Because you see him with fucking Zeus, is like he's just standing there basically. And like you see Hogan selling this fucking bear hug and shit. It's like, you know, it's, you know, Hogan's um, a good worker. Also, I realized this watching this match, and I don't know if they made this meant this to be intentional, but you know how he um uh, Zeus keeps putting in a bear hug and Hogan gets out, right? Yeah. Brock Lesnar's match with Hogan. You know Brock Lesnar beats him with a bear hug. Beats him with a bear hug with blood and he puts the blood and on I his chest. And I feel like, like I almost feel like they were like calling back to this match. Like Brock did what Zeus couldn't. You know, I don't know. I felt like this was a very, very much like they studied this match and then went back. I don't know. Like you I feel like that it kind of does sound like it. that was a SmackDown match. I remember that. that yeah, was that was very... a, but but that was a when Hogan wants to put you over, he knows how to put you over. Yeah, I, yeah. I felt like if you had just watched this Zeus match and Brock does the bear hug, you're like, oh, he's gonna get out of it. Then he does it, and it's like now you made Brock. Hogan did a lot for Brock. Hogan did for what? Oh. What all and and he didn't suffer for it. No one ever like Hogan was ever seen after he lost to Brock like that. Hogan's still a fucking legend, but the way he lost to Brock, bro, was pretty fucking impressive. I know you don't like this person too much, but recently Chris Jericho said he thinks Hogan was a better. Oh, no, we worker. had that conversation. Yeah, I agree. yeah, he. I agree. He Hogan's a better worker than Ric Flair. Ric Flair's a better. Well, wrestler. not in 1989, nine, or 1989, but overall. From like eighty three to like today, yes, Hogan is. But right now, in eighty three, nineteen eighty nine, Hogan's a better worker, not yeah, wrestler. Yeah. Worker, yeah. like working the audience, working the audience, working the audience. I fucking love. But it. uh, yeah, I thought like, look, they they were gearing these events not for people like how, who we are today, which is like you know we enjoy like work rate, we enjoy. They're building this event for little kids, and if you're a little kid, you left this event very happy. Zeus got pinned. Warrior got the belt again. Uh, Roddy Piper's after Rick Rude. There's some stuff that might upset you, like all oh, the Rockers lost and or Jimmy Snooker lost. But 
overall, this was meant for a kid, and I think they did a great job. If you're, I would say, if you're looking for some quality wrestling matches and stuff, I wouldn't watch this. A lot of yeah. too much bullshit finishes. But if you want just eighties wrestling, yeah, if you want eighties wrestling, this is probably it. But overall, not a terrible show. Not a terrible show, but not the greatest. I thought Great American Bash was way better. So yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So the next four weeks. We have four more shows in 89 until we go into the 90s. Um, next week, we're going to do Halloween Havoc 89, which is Sting and Flair versus Funk and Great Muda. Next week is Halloween Havoc? Yeah. Then in two uh-huh. weeks, we've got um, Survivor Series 89, which is Team Warrior versus Team Andre. That's the main event. Then um, in three weeks, we have Starcade 89, which is the Iron Man Future Shock Tournament, which basically like the G1, but kind of done stupidly. Then um, in four weeks, we have something very interesting. At the end of 1989, WWF did a one-match pay-per-view called No Holds Barred The Match The Movie, where they showed the movie, and then they showed a match that was pre-taped where it was Hogan and Beefcake versus Zeus and Macho Man in a steel cage. So, we're not going to watch just that one match. What they did was they put that match on Super Tape 1 which is on the network. It's a compilation of a bunch of different matches. It's two hours. We're going to watch that and review it and count that, like, because we, I, it's like dumb for us to, like, do a whole paper, a whole podcast on just one match. You know what I'm saying? And right. I don't want to. Re- so when they originally did this pay per view, they did the movie and they then. Show they showed you the movie, movie, then immediately went to the match. Yeah. Is this movie on Peacock? No, I don't think so. Damn it. Cause I was going to say we should watch the movie and the match and then. Well, I, I, well but I like. The- but, 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 but I wanna uh, yeah, but like I feel like it's gonna be more fun to talk about this this whole tape, super tape volume one. And, okay. Yeah, yeah. The movie, like the I don't there's not a lot to say about the movie. It's bad. But I think yeah, we'll have a lot to say about this movie. What? I think we'll have a lot to say about this movie. Well we'll we'll figure it out. I'd rather do super tape volume, but we'll we have a few weeks. But yeah, it was a one match pay per view where we're gonna it counts, it was a pay per view. So can you imagine them trying to sell a one match pay per view? I'm sorry? Can you imagine them trying to do a one match pay per view now? That'd be fucking. Yeah, that would be very weird. By the, but... by the way, I don't trust people. I'm, I'm, I now meet people who call them premium live events because that's what they. I don't trust you if you do that. It's a pay per view. I'm sorry. A PLE? I'm not really calling it a PLE. No, um, it's a pay per view. I don't give a fuck. It's what it's always been called. And, um, guys, if you enjoyed this podcast, uh, please subscribe, rate us on iTunes, give us, give us some love. Um, also follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Ray Goots. Follow Andrew Lee. Oh, wait, he yeah. doesn't do anything. Don't follow him. Don't wait, follow do you do anything now? Well, I might have to. Yeah. We'll see. There, there's Matilda looking at you. You see her? I know. I'm glad this one didn't puke on your bed this time. No, she, no she's okay today. She's like, what is this guy doing? Um, and then follow me on TikTok, Ray Goots Comedy. And next week, we'll be back in WCW. Talk about the first Halloween Havoc. Halloween Havoc 89. I'm excited. It looks like a good show. Yeah, I can't wait to watch Rey Mysterio versus uh, look, uh, Eddie Guerrero. Well, that's, that's years from now. <laughs> I'm just joking. But uh, Lex Luger does fight Flying Brian, so that's basically Oh, excellent. I like Lex Luger. So that's good. We'll, we'll see you then, guys. Thank you. See you, guys.